Hello, everybody. I'm Silva Harapetian. Welcome to another edition of the Silva Harapetian Show. You know, I've been doing these series during COVID where we talk about all the things that matter in our lives and are impacting our lives. And we've covered a lot in this last several months. Today is something very special, something that is very personal to me and it's very sort of um, inside baseball. But it's actually really good because it gives people an opportunity to see inside the world of journalism and with the way things have been moving and the way journalism and how it's delivered and how it connects to people has been actually in the forefront. I think it's a really important time to talk about these things. My name is Jasmine Miner and I'm a TV news reporter in Cincinnati and I'm partnering up with black journalists to launch a campaign called Everything We Can Say. We realize there's a lot going on in the world right now from police brutality cases to Black Lives Matter protests. And we've also heard a lot, but there's one group that we really haven't heard from just yet, and that's us. So we created Everything We Can't Say, which is a safe platform for black journalists to share what they experience behind the scenes. And it's also a chance for the public to hear the very real, raw, and unfiltered perspectives of what doesn't make the front page. My guest today, Jasmine Miner. She is a reporter out of Cincinnati. Hello, Jasmine. Thank you for joining Hello. us. I have so much more to say about this, but I feel like I want to introduce you and bring you into the conversation before we move forward. I think one of the most important things that has happened since COVID, since the Black Lives Matter movement, since the insurrection, since everything that has unfolded is that the, the audience the readers, the people who absorb news have been able to see live news unfold. And for so many years, people only saw what we produced and put out and never saw what happened behind the scenes in the process of producing the story. And that process is so much different and such a different experience than the final product that so many people saw. Mm -hmm. And along the way, our voice got lost in the shuffle. Talk to me a little bit about this project that you've started that is meant to give journalists a voice without putting their job and their security at jeopardy. Yeah, so the project is called Everything We Can't Say, and uh, it was created because, uh, like you said, there is an entire process that happens behind the scenes with journalists, particularly in this case, what we're focusing on is black journalists. And what I wanted to do is, A, give them a platform to speak um, their their concerns, the obstacles they face, um, even in, in some instances, how they've reached sort of the mountaintop, right? Share their stories in a way where they don't have to face uh, the retaliation, right, that you might see that happens across the country. But at the same time, I wanted to create something where the public can also can get a very transparent view into what goes on behind the scenes. And the reason that is so important that while we, we don't necessarily want to be in the story as journalists, however, if certain voices are being muzzled behind the scenes, that affects what is shown on TV. That affects what's written on the front page of a newspaper. And if certain perspectives are eliminated from those stories, um, that therefore impacts what's recorded in history. This letter is from a photographer, from a reporter, manager, producer, writer. This person works in the Midwest, West Coast, small town, the network. She says, I have nightmares about getting shot every night from a weather anchor. He says, I was out reporting in a white neighborhood and neighbors called the cops on me for knocking on my interviewee's door. My photographer, also a black male, was brought to tears. He kept repeating to me, this is how we die. One of the things that I remember being a professional journalist being told all the time is that you are not the story. This isn't about you. It is not about your voice. It is not about your opinion. It is not even about the experience you have of getting the story. It is about the story and you are not the story, except we are living in very unusual times. Are you okay? I'm getting shot, I'm getting- Okay, Katie, are you okay? Rubber bullets, rubber bullets, it's okay. It's those pepper bullets. It's those pepper are they, bullets. That who are they aiming that at? 
Now you're uh, shooting at the photographer. Us, like directly at us. Directly Why are they yeah. doing that? They're shooting at our crew. You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, whoa, telling whoa, whoa, whoa. me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? Okay. I think journalism and the entire industry has always operated in this cloak of secrecy, right? It's been, we've been in this league, all of us, for a lack of a better way of describing it, all of us, all in, within the industry, we are literally one degree of separation. We, You and I have never met. I literally connected with you on Instagram. Uh, and the moment we jumped on the phone, we already have someone in common that we know. So, and if we spoke a few more minutes, we know mo many people in the industry. One degree of separation. This is a very small business and everything operate. It has its own ecosystem. It has its own culture. It has its own, it, it, and it's very protective of that because we not only, not only see the world from a different perspective as journalists in general, but we also operate in a different world and we live a very, very different lifestyle than most can even understand. And I think yeah. there's, there is really, there's value to, to that protectiveness, but there's also the, the downside of not show, not showing, not being transparent, right? So it eliminates the opportunity for people to understand uh, that we are human beings first and foremost. Yeah. And I, yeah, it, it absolutely yeah. does. And that really struck me when I, when I saw your project is I re it, it for so long, one of, one of my personal goals in the 20 some odd years I've been in the business is to humanize journalists, to be more human than what people see us, right? I, you know, people see us as almost like these characters on television or, or, you know, the, the, the person with the pen and, you know, writing it for the newspaper, but we're people first and foremost, right? And journalism is just what we do. And the experience we have is, I think it has multiple prongs with what you're talking about. Some of the stuff that you've been sharing by, from journalists come from how they're treated by the public. And some of the things that come from is how they're treated and silenced within the organization that they work in. And both yeah. need to be talked about. Tell me what inspired you to take on a project like this. Yeah, uh, well, it, it's been a long year. <laughs> 2020 was a very long year for everybody. Um, and it was actually a couple of months after the pandemic first started where uh, we saw the George Floyd protests really take off. Where we find uh, Jasmine Miner this morning live at the University of Cincinnati, where those protests continue throughout the night. Jasmine, good morning to you. It, that was something that not only affected me very deeply on a personal level, but I think I saw that with other journalists of color, black journalists specifically. Um, and, I, and I just kept hearing these stories and these feelings come out, but there was no place to really talk about them. There was no outlet to put them. We just kind of talked amongst ourselves and that was it. Um, and at my station in particular, we have a, uh, an internal committee that uh, specifically focuses on some of these issues and uh, they meet once a month. And pretty much it's a chance to kind of speak your mind, um, kind of say what you feel, it's a, it's a safe place. At the time, I could not attend the meeting because I, I had to anchor that day. And so uh, I said, well, you know, I really have a lot to say. <laughs> I really, I really am feeling a lot. And, and it's a really important meeting because it was the first one after all these protests had broke out in Cincinnati. And so I wrote a letter. Um, it was a fairly long letter, two, three pages. Um, it explained the way I had felt. Um, as a as a black woman, um, as a journalist, as a journalist working in Cincinnati, as journalist seeing everything that's going on um, in the world, um, covering these stories, uh, having different conversations within the station, um, and it was a very honest letter. Mm -hmm. um, 
And after I had written the letter, a, a lot of my colleagues had reached out, uh, specifically my white colleagues, who had said, you know, we actually learned a lot. I, I had no idea this was this was a thing. I had no idea that you really felt that way and it impacted you so deeply. Um, and that was pretty much the birth of everything we can't say. Um, I wanted to take that experience of being in a safe place, being able to write down honestly, transparently, what I had personally experienced and create that experience for the rest of my colleagues of color. The process is really simple. All you have to do is go to everythingwecantsay.com, click the button, submit a letter, and then we'll ask you a few questions for verification purposes. But after that, you write a first person anonymous, 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 did I say anonymous? Write an anonymous letter on your experiences at work and outside of it. Those letters will then be read out loud through a YouTube series by other journalists and inspiring journalists who will also give a few words of encouraging advice. We wanted this to be something that was respectful, something um, that uh, was carefully done. This is not a project that was created in a day or two and put together. This is something that was probably seven to eight months in the making. Um, because we wanted to be very thorough. We wanted to be very detail-oriented about this. Um, it, it's, an, it's, it's an important thing to do, and there are things that I think the public needs to understand. And the better understanding the public can get, the more change we can see in the industry, the better stories we can write. Um, and so really, even though it is meant specifically for black journalists, everybody can get something out of this. Um, and that really is the goal, and that's the hope. Yeah, you know, um, I actually want to address multiple things um, moving forward. The first thing I want to address is race, right? Um, and I, I will preface this by giving people a little bit of a perspective from where I where I come from. Um, I have worked as a television journalist for 20-some-odd years. I've worked in California, Oklahoma, Texas, Detroit, Michigan, and Miami. So... I have experienced and covered every news and every presidential race, every kind of horrific crime and celebration you could possibly think of. And with that has come the things that people write letters about to you anonymously. I will publicly say because I'm in a position where this is my platform. I don't work for an organization. I can say it. I have been chased with a bat. I have been hassled in the streets. You know this because every time you step out and you're mm -hmm. covering a story, somehow you're not a human being, but a thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been, I, I have stared down the barrel of a gun multiple times. I have, and most recently, I was physically assaulted. I look like sh Please put away your cell phones. This is not a recordable event. Okay, so that's what I have to deal with. I don't want your fucking truck in front of my house. I don't want to be pushed and I don't want a finger in my face. I've been trying really hard not to cry. This is what we do. Those are the things that the public does not see that we have to go through in order to bring the story to people in order for the it's it's the cost of getting the story and getting the story right um even with that said i am armenian i don't know how much you know about armenians um we we have been um we've been persecuted victimized, been victims of genocide about a hundred years ago. We have been displaced and most of us are dispersed around the world um, and just most recently witnessed the second potential genocide of our people in our country. So I am no stranger to being bullied, victimized, marginalized, discriminated against. Even with all of that said, it is not lost on me that I look still, even though I feel different, I look different in America and I'm still treated differently in America. And what my black and brown brothers and sisters, journalists out there in the street experience are 
so much worse than I will ever experience. So I say that to say there is also a level of anxiety and fear in sharing these stories because I'm very clear about the privilege I have in being able to talk about these right now for many reasons. One, I don't work for an organization and two, because I look the way I do, right? Because of my skin color. But so many of, of so many people I've talked to um, as part of the National Association of Black Journalists, I'm a member as part of the National Association of, of Hispanic Journalists, the experiences in the streets are so much worse. And when you take those experiences and you bring it to the organization, how it's dealt with, how it's managed really does matter. And it impacts how well you deliver your story and how well you do in your career. And I all say all of this to, to set up a question. What is the fear that people have of sharing what goes on and what their personal story is and experiences? What is the fear that has re that made you realize that these letters have to be anonymous? It's the retaliation. Um, and that, that's, that looks, that looks very different on, on different levels. Um, sometimes it's the, you're in a position where you're not supposed to do the story. Right. And so sometimes the public can take, of uh, speaking out or expressing yourself or the way you feel as uh, selfish in many ways. Mm. Um, sometimes uh, in, internally, um, it, it can be seen as, well, you know, why, why, sh why should we, we care really about this? Um, you might face things that, uh, whether it's, kind of being put in a box in a certain way, being put in a corner, not, not um, allowed to touch certain stories, um, not allowed to do certain things because um, you've expressed things that have happened to you that uh, may not make the place you work look very good. This letter is from, this person works in the Midwest, West Coast, small town, the network. She says, the news director was discussing my hair and another black female producer's hair in a staff meeting. He commented that my hair was good and that her hair was nappy. He says, I was told I was too fat and too black to ever be a senior reporter. It's not that we don't want to speak up. It's not that there was never a chance where we, uh, we, we really took it upon ourselves to say something. It's that when we did, um, we weren't valued. We weren't cared for. Nothing changed, right? Nothing happened. Um, but some journalists tell me I, I did lose my job a couple months later. Um, I wasn't allowed to, um, anchor anymore. I, you know, I was kind of putting it, put in a box in a way. And really, aside from just kind of personal battles, uh, the other part that is, is really crucial is that when you have uh, voices who are diverse, um, and they, those voices are being silenced or those voices are not really being heard. You therefore don't get those stories, right? And one mm -hmm. viewer, um, I was going to say one, I've gotten this question from multiple viewers over my course of my career, which is, uh, they say, Jasmine, how come the only time I see black people on TV is when you're talking about crime or a protest? <laughs> There's right. so much more to the community that is going on aside from that, right? Right. And, uh, and sometimes the response is, well, you know, sometimes I just I didn't get a chance to really do some of the other stories that, that I wanted to do. Um, and, and I think I have been in, in a fortunate place where, you know, after I had uh, expressed the way the George Floyd protests had impacted me, I was greeted with support. Mm. Um, but I had realized that with my other colleagues across the country, really, um, that's not always the case. In fact, oftentimes it's not the case. And so this really is not a project that is about calling people out. It's not about, um, you know, saying this is bad and they did that and they did that. It's about getting out your voice in a safe way where you feel valued and by others hearing and listening and learning they, for, can help produce the positive change that we want. 
I congratulate you and commend you for taking this project on. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I looked at it and I was like, dang, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> you know, that, that, so congratulations. It's, it's really amazing. And believe it or not, um, I speaking for myself, someone who's been in the middle of it, so someone who's experienced all of it, which by the way, in a, even though I have, again, I always preface, it's still, I'm still privileged for not having experienced some of the things that, mm -hmm. you know, you do, but um, it, it, it's been so important to feel acknowledged, to feel like you're human, you know, like just this last week, we saw Sarah Snyder on CNN ha have a moment, right? She, she broke down crying. You know, this is the 10th hospital that I have been, <laughs> I'm sorry. CNN Sarah this Seidner breaks down on live television, reporting on the COVID-19 deaths. I apologize. I'm going to try to try to get through this. This is the 10th hospital that I have been in. It's really hard to take. I'm sorry, Allison. I don't know how you were trained, but when I was trained, you didn't show emotion, right? Your yeah, emotion. Not like that. Your emotion yeah. was in your story. You didn't, you as a, as a person, you're delivering the news. You don't show emotion. But at the end of the day, if we, as, as journalists, if we stop feeling, then we don't have the humanity that's necessary to actually tell the story that the audience will connect with and understand. And I think we have to have an outlet. We have to have a safe space. And the fact that retaliation and I'm having you talk about it. I know it. I've experienced it. I've lived it. Um, the fact that we are acknowledging that there is no space for some people to actually do that, and you've created that, I think is going to make a world of difference. It could potentially even save some careers. So, yeah, so proud of I, you. I, I, I certainly, I, I really do hope so. Um, you know, and it's funny because. I, I, of course, had a ton of black journalists reach out, but also also white journalists and kind of say, hey, uh, how can we support? How can right. we how, what can what can we do? And, and one uh, posed a question um, asking, what are some terms and phrases that white journalists have, have been using or you've seen us using that um, we need to do better when describing communities of color? Um, and so that, that's one of the questions that I'll pose for, you know, black journalists to sort of answer mm -hmm. through their letters. I know there is a level of courage in you that isn't in everybody else, just by the sheer fact that you've created this project. And I know that there is a support system around you within your own family and your own life and the organization that you work for that has allowed you to do this. But there are so many of us so many people like you that are not in that place. What do you want to say to them? That it's okay that you are not alone in this place, that the experience the obstacles that you're having or did have or currently going through, it's okay. It's okay to feel emotion when you watch that George Floyd video or the Breonna Taylor um, or Ahmaud Aubrey, right? Um, it's okay to feel. When I watched... Um, Sarah Snyder on CNN. I watched. I happened to be watching at the time when when I first saw that um, her her live shot, and uh, I felt what she felt. Mm. I, I felt her, and I wanted. You know, I, I I've only met her once, but if I was there in person, I I would I would tell her it's okay because there are people, there are journalists who need to hear that, who need to see that from someone like you, who feel what you feel. And what I really want people to know is if you don't have that support system, that everything we can't say, we are here to support you. We are here to be with you. We are standing beside you.
that when you share your story, you are not just venting, you are not just just putting it down on paper and it goes inside some black hole. You are empowering yourself, you are empowering others, and you're also teaching others at the same time, and you are part of the greater good that is, let us all do some really great journalism, right? That's what we all want. Mm. Um, and I want people to feel that this project is solely dependent on people sharing their stories, right? And the more you do that, the more stories that are shared, the more stories that are submitted and written and, um, put in our, our Instagram messages or whatever way people reach out to us, the more that happens the more change we're going to see. And that's what I want people to see. There is not a certain um, feeling you need to have. If you have one sentence to write, you can write that. If you have three paragraphs, you can write that. If you've got a couple of pages, yeah. there I have not put any limit on it. It is for your experience. It is for your benefit. And that's it. And really, um, I personally... And the project as a whole is here to serve. We are here to be a service. Um, and we are here to inspire, to encourage, and to empower. And I truly believe wholeheartedly that if we can do that, we're going to see change on a massive level, on a good, positive level that goes so far beyond just those who work in media. And uh, to me, even though I think doing this project, I definitely had uh, times where I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure about it. I, you know, I just will it work? Will it not? I went back and forth for a long time on it. Um, but what gives me courage and what really said, you know, I we got to put this together was reading those letters. And I said, all right. Um, it's not a super fancy project. It's not this huge production. It's actually very straightforward. It's actually a very simple process. But those letters, they sell themselves. They are incredibly and, powerful. Incredibly powerful. And that, yep. And that's and I think I think that's uh, that needs to be heard. And so my message is that it's okay. We are here to serve you. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for for that. And you know. I, I, I recognize that in you because I know what I had to go through to get myself to a point of sharing that video. That's why I wanted you to see it is because I know the process I had to go through to publicly, you know, in this case, you, you know, you, they, people are sending it anonymously, but you are publicly sort of talking about it. You are the conduit. Mm -hmm. So and, and that takes a different level of self-awareness and courage that, uh, you know, it's been really rough. It's been a rough five, six, seven years. Um, you know, I, I, re I remember covering presidential campaigns and, uh, and, and came back and I, I, told, I told my managers, I've never been afraid of covering a story before. I worked in the streets of Detroit. Mm -hmm. I've never been afraid of covering a story. And I feared for my life covering those rallies. Mm -hmm. And simply because of the whole fake news thing. And I cannot even imagine what my black and brown brothers and sisters felt covering those rallies. Yeah. Um, so it, 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 for me, it started there, the anxiety of, and continuously sort of snowballing down in the last few years. And then we saw George Floyd, and then we saw the protests, and then we saw, and when you're in it and you're covering it, it takes so much out of you. So um, thank you for, for talking to me. Um, I've purposely sort of drawn out this conversation and this interview to allow people to process what we're saying. We're not, you know, if you're not a journalist and if you're just listening and this is the first time you're hearing about what we do, we're not asking you to agree with us. We're not asking you to support us. We're not asking you to um, determine whether we're the right or the left. We're asking you to consider us as human beings because if we can't do our jobs then 
you're not going to get your news, <laughs> essentially. If we're right. not okay, right. right? If we're not okay, you're not going to have all the voices represented and all the perspectives that are necessary for you to make a determination of what it is that you want to believe. And that's what this entire country was built on. So yeah. thank you so and that, much. And that, that, impacts, that impacts the history that's written that, down, right? That impacts absolutely. what's recorded, what's taught in our schools. Um, if, if, if you want to change certain stereotypes, uh, the news is a very powerful factor in that. Have you gotten anything that's made you take a breath? Have you read a letter that's made you kind of go, <gasps> I think we've all faced a certain level of assault out in the field in some way. Um, but I think the one that probably tugged at my heart the most is um, there was a photographer who had written in um, his company had given um, everyone at the station um, these little cards, these profile cards. And on the card, it explained what type of viewer um, watched the station. So, it, you know, it was uh, mostly white women in this age group, this type of person, right? And the whole point of getting the card was, this is who your viewer is, and this is who your story needs to be about. Um, that, you know, even though that's not a situation where someone's, their, their life is at stake, or, um, you know, they're in an unsafe situation or something extreme, I think about how much power that has. I think about how many stations across the country that company owns. Mm -hmm. And I think about how many people are watching that. And if the only stories you tell are about white, um, you know, ages, I think they said like 30 to 35 to 50, right, and in specific neighborhoods, um, how are you doing everything else? Mm. Um, and, and that just, that really set me in because I, I had no idea that that was, that was even a thing that, that an organization would actually say, this is your target audience. Right. Um, because I remember, there's no I rem way. I remember that, that every, conversation. I remember that conversation. I remember a conversation where in an, in a newsroom meeting where they said, this is the demographic, the demographic that watches the five o'clock. But this is the demographic that watches the six o'clock. Mm -hmm. So for the five o'clock, this is where you will be and this is what you'll cover, which is a s very s different part of town. Then for six o'clock, this is where you'll be and this is what you'll cover. It was a completely different part of town. Let's just say one's right. downtown and one's in the suburbs. So you get the picture, right? Right. So right. serving serving the viewer, right? Which at the end of the day, <laughs> I get it. But at the same time, like... I think this year has made it very clear that if we don't speak up and if we continue to stay silent and if we don't, if we don't cover all perspectives, we've seen what happens. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and at the same time, you know, even though that is a demographic, are we really doing a service to those viewers? Are we really serving them? Because the whole point of, you know, journalism is to showcase things that people may not know, right? Like in every story we do, we always want to find, you know, this is this is the reason why we're showing you this, because right. you don't already know this information, right? We're bringing you new things. Right. So if you're not able to share the perspective, if you're not able to showcase inclusion and diversity and the way um, things can impact like the pandemic in different communities, you are therefore doing a disservice because you're not actually giving someone something new. You're just giving them one type of way of thinking. And the problem is that's not how the world works. Um, one more question. I'm going to let you go. How are you holding up? How are you doing? You know, I'm okay. Um, I'm okay. It was, uh, uh, it was a rough year. It really was. Um, it was a very emotional, <laughs> devastating year. Um, and, I had to, you know, even though, you know, I am a person of color, I still had to take a step back and say, how can I be better, right? Because 
clearly me just, you know, and I'm a morning reporter, so sometimes I get assigned to a lot of crime, right? Um, and I had to really think about um, what am I showcasing here? Um, and is it good enough, right? Yeah. Is, is, it, is this really up to the standard that it needs to be? Um, and the truth is, is that I had, I had to take a step back and be like, you know what, you, you gotta step it up. You, you gotta, you gotta make this voice heard. You gotta, you gotta fight to make sure that, um, you know, we don't show the mugshot of the victim in a shooting, you know, (laughs) and the mugshot 95% of the time is a black man, right? So it's, it's things like that. And so, um. This, this honestly, even though this project is, is definitely to serve by serving, it has definitely uplifted me. Um, I think there is a natural, um, a natural sense of encouragement, self-encouragement that people get when you give. Yeah. Right. And also uh, you're creating a sense of community and essentially telling yourself that you're certainly not alone by telling everybody else that they're not alone, which is great. Yeah. You know, I I agree with you. I've, 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 I've had to do the same. Like how, how can I be better? How can I do more? How can I, and part of, you know, what, what I can do and I'm privileged to do is not working for a specific organization is having these hard and difficult conversations with, with people, you know, and, yeah. Uh, creating a platform where we can talk about these things, where we are addressing things that are hard to address and to say, yes, yeah. I experienced this, but I still believe and know that I am privileged in that space, you know? Yeah. And, and I hope, and I hope that I hope, cause I, I know eventually, you know, organizations, um, networks, industry will sort of catch on to the project or have seen it. I really, I really hope that when they do look at it, they see it in a way of, you know, this is actually really needed and yeah. not push it, you know, to the core and to the side. Um, but, you know, and I think that's that's definitely a, a risk that, that I decided to take. Um, and I think this is just too important. Um, and so I I, I, uh, I really hope that that, that is something that is well received. And I think that when people follow it, there might be managers, organizations that say, OK, let me listen here. And let me figure out how we ourselves can do better. And yeah. I think they're gonna they're gonna find that. I really, really do. Yeah. Thank you, Jasmine, for taking time out of your day to join us. You know, for those of you who don't know, she gets up like at two o'clock in the morning. Did I get that right? At two? Yeah. At two yeah. o'clock in the morning. So she's talking to me in the afternoon. Thanks for staying awake super late for us today. And for those of you who want to find us and want to send me some story ideas, you can find me on social media. Otherwise, find us at your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next time. We talk ordinary people, extraordinary stories, living life on their own terms. 